Okay, so in this video, I want to talk about the significance and the importance of the secret place. Now, a lot of the times we think the secret place is go into your room, shut the door, and if you pray to your father in secret, he will reward you publicly. But there is times where you can be praying, you can be reading scripture, but still feel disconnected and detached from God, which is not the case. This is emotions. This is fear feelings, which is not true because the scriptures say that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you, meaning no matter what you did, you know, you think of David and Bathsheba. He got a man killed because of his sin, but he repented and God never left him. And I'm just saying like the severity of no matter what it is, God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will always be there. Now you can grieve the Holy Spirit because a Holy Spirit, well, it's holy. And if we're doing unholy things, unjust things, or we're doing things outside of God, it's going to suppress, it's going to water down his spirit. And when that happens, we can get to a place where we're leaning on our own understanding or we're operating in our own strength. And we can tap into sensual wisdom, which the scriptures talk about. And this tends to happen and when we are not walking in harmony, walking in step with God, we pick up this sensual wisdom, this earthly wisdom when we're operating in our own strength, in our own understanding. And this was something that Todd White brought up. And it is so true. When you're not abiding in Christ, I mean, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit is with you. But if you're not taking that time with him, if you don't have that peace that surpasses all understanding, the comforter of the Holy Spirit, if you can't just feel his presence, because a lot of the times we leave God at home and then we go to church. We leave God at the church and then we go to our job because we're like, oh, well, we have a secular job. So why would I take God there when we're called to be the light of the world? So you take the light of the world into these secular places. But a lot of the times we just leave God out of certain things or certain situations where we could just be on autopilot operating in our own strength. And the scripture says, if you think you are strong, be careful lest you fall. There's so many times where we could be, I don't want to say depart from, but we could be outside of God's will, outside of what the Lord has us to do, which he will turn all things around anyways. You think of Jonah the prophet, how God turned his disobedience into something that glorified God and fulfilled his will. Let's break this down. He was running away from Nineveh because it was a violent place. It would be like us going to the Middle East or somewhere where they despise Christians or some violent place preaching about repentance. This is what God called Jonah the prophet to do. And he's like, no way. So he ran away and he got thrown off a boat, swallowed up by a whale. And the whale spit him out into Nineveh. And these people praised and worshipped the marine kingdom. They were worshipping a fish god, the water kingdom. That's what they were worshipping, which is something that is very common. It's still very common. So he got spit spit out by a fish and that was their god. He had acid. He had all of this stuff all over him that made him glow. And they're like, this guy just got spit out of our god. Let's listen to him. And he's like, no, there's actually another god. You guys got to repent. And they're like, okay, okay, okay. And they all fasted. So even in his disobedience, God turned it around. And even in our disobedience, I don't want to preach this because Saul was disobedient. There's a difference. So when you're just disobedient because you don't care, you're disobedient and you are a man after God's heart. No, he will turn around all things. It says that God will turn around all things that are bad for those that love him. When you love God, he will turn around different things. The importance of the secret place is because Christ says, apart from me, you cannot do nothing, which is true. Apart from the vine of life, you cannot do nothing because we are the branches. You cannot produce fruit without Christ. You cannot have a peace that surpasses all understanding without Christ. You cannot have joy, which is your strength. You can have your human strength outside of Christ, but it said, oh, you think you are strong, but 
lest you will fall. You can only stand so long with your own flesh and blood, by your own means, with your own understanding, until God will inevitably cause you to crash. Because if you're operating in your own strength, you're exalting yourself, you're running on your own fumes. And it says, whoever exalts themselves will be humbled. That's why when you are operating in your own strength, when you are leaning on your own understanding, when you are doing what seems right to a man, inevitably you will fall if you are walking with God. And if you're not walking with God, you will just stumble and not know why you are stumbling. The Bible says that the wicked, they stumble and they don't know why they stumble. But when you're with God, outside of God, or maybe you grieve the Holy Spirit or you're running too fast or doing your whatever it may be, you will have that fall. I and mean, it usually leads back to the secret place. The secret place is very important for so many different reasons and the Lord will always bring you back to that place and it can be for various different reasons. He will bring you to that place first and foremost because he is a jealous God. He wants your attention and that's why when you're walking with the Lord you are isolated. You are alone and you are not lonely. You will be lonely if you're not with God. It's not really feeling the presence or just like thinking about life, thinking about the future, thinking about these things. Then yes, you will be lonely if you're not in the presence of God or you're not abiding with God. But a lot of the times he wants you isolated and alone at times because it has many different benefits. First and foremost, when you are actually present with Christ, you will have things exposed. You will have things revealed. Your intentions will come to the surface. When you're abiding with Christ, that's where you really can forgive people because you have the love of Christ. You have the heart of Christ or you just feel the joy. You feel the comforter come upon you, which gives gives you the strength, which gives you the heart posture to forgive people who have done you wrong, to actually love people, to be at peace with people, to do the right things. When you're abiding with Christ, there is many positives. So I want to break down the positives and the significance of this secret place because we all need it. So if you are running outside of God, even if you have been a Christian for so long, Todd White is like, let's bring Christians back to Christ because it's true. Just because you go to a church, just because you have been a Christian for so long, doesn't mean you have a great relationship with the Lord. Doesn't mean he's very present. Doesn't mean he, his spirit is very potent or that you're doing the correct things. There was all of these different churches inside of the Bible and one of them, God was saying that he was locked out of it. You know, he was saying the Holy Spirit was locked out of it and he's like, are you guys done? Like, are you going to allow me in? And he was outside of a church that Christians were attending so just because you go to assemblies, the scriptures say do not forsake assemblies, but you know, a lot of the times the assemblies can turn into things that are not of God. It says in the scriptures that in the end times people won't tolerate sound doctrine. There's man-made tradition. It says that people worship him in vain. Their hearts are far from him. So just because you are in an assembly doesn't mean your connection with God is great because even singing worship songs, you could be exalting yourself. You're singing and you're like, I exalt me, I exalt me. But the Father is really not being shown. And you're like, well, how is that the case? Because I'm a Christian. And just because I go to church every single Sunday, it doesn't mean I have a great relationship with God. You know, sometimes when I pull back, when I take that time out to go to that secret place, that's when the relationship picks back up. And you need it because when you go to the secret place, you refill. You refill yourself with with life. And if you have a life-giving spirit, if you have the creator spirit inside of you, you're going to produce fruit because that's what the creator spirit does. It produces life. And he turns your crooked path straight. Things go a lot smoother. You get in less delay. You're not as double-minded when you are walking with the Lord. A lot of the times when you're not abiding in Christ, here is what happens. You start to operate in your own strength. A lot of the times this happens, you begin to forget about Christ. And this is why he'll pull you back. Paul said, I don't want to be too poor lest I curse you or too rich lest I forget about you. When people's lives get too good, they get too rich. Not that God is against wealth, but you know, it has pangs to it. It has temptations and that's just something you have to be honest about. But if you could steward it well, that's a different story. Christ is not against that because he has come so you can live life to the full, live life abundantly. But you need to be mature. You need to have the character and you need to steward that properly and make sure that it goes to the right places and to be obedient and to have your hand out just like God.
God has his hands out and do the proper things. The scriptures talk about sensual wisdom, sensual wisdom, which is earthly wisdom. So when you're outside of Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a pastor, it doesn't matter if you're a leader, it doesn't matter if you've been a Christian for 20 years, it happens because it happened to me. You begin to operate on your own understanding. You begin to operate on your own strength when you're kind of like disconnected from the spirit, grieving the spirit or away from that secret place, spending time with God. You can take scripture and dance along the lines and say, yeah, but did God really say? And this is where sensual wisdom comes in when you're outside, when you're not abiding in Christ. And the scripture talks about sensual wisdom, which is demonic wisdom. It's earthly wisdom. It's self-seeking wisdom for pleasure, for self-gain. When you're outside of Christ or when you're operating in your own strength, leaning on your own understanding, doing what seems right to a man, that is such a snare because you have this sensual wisdom of, yes, you're still following the law of God. You have your own understanding. You have your own motives, your own secrets, and you will kind of manipulate, I guess you could say, or you will self-seek. Like you're trying to do your own thing, but the law keeps popping up and it rejects what you are doing when you're not abiding in Christ. You are leaning on your own understanding. You are leaning on your own strength. You are doing what seems right to a man. There is a way that seems right to a man. When you're not abiding in Christ, you begin to do what seems right to a man. And it becomes this self-seeking, this sensual wisdom, this earthly wisdom. The law keeps popping up and it's rebuking you. It's rejecting you. But there's really not that conviction because you're doing what seems right to a man. You see this scripture and you begin to dance around it to do what seems right to a man. And you're dancing around the law and then another law pops up. Here's what happens if you're a leader, if you're a pastor, or if you're a teacher, or if you've been walking with Christ for a long time, you could be in this state and you will begin to throw on religious burdens, begin to throw on the law like the Pharisees or the Sadducees. You fear the Lord yourself. People will fear the Lord because nobody's going to fear the Lord if they don't see you fearing the Lord yourself. And when you're operating, leaning on your own understanding, you want people to change. You're tacking on all of these religious burdens. Now, I want to talk about it. People talk about legalism, but when you're with Christ, walking with Christ, there's nothing legal about it. It's the law of God. And if you love God, if you walk with God, if you honor God, if you want to be in right standing and righteousness, obviously you're going to follow the law. But the thing is, is when it comes to the law of God, there's a difference. When you're doing what seems right to a man, the law keeps popping up as a Christian and it just seems like it's rebuking you. You're trying to do it. It's like disciplinary. If you're trying to do it in your own strength and it's difficult. But when you're abiding in Christ and you have a relationship, it's second nature. It's like, I want to do this because I know that Christ has a hope for me, plans to prosper me, plans not to harm me. Like you trust God because he's present. You're, you trust God because he's with you. You have that peace that surpasses all understanding. You have the joy of the Lord. When you feel him present, you can trust him. And when you trust him, when you feel him, when you bring him to your workplace, when you bring him to the church, when you bring him outside of the church, when you really walk with him, you will really follow his law and it won't be burdensome. It will be a relationship and you will do it because you know that it will strengthen that bond. It's just like, for example, a wife. You love your wife or you love your husband and you feel that presence. You feel that they love you. When they say something, obviously, you're going to want to strengthen that bond. Obviously, it's not like the law connects you. It's just like also like, you know, a father that you know has good intentions, that you know loves you, that is present, that is active and is saying things and you know that you can trust him, that if you follow those, you're going to have the best outcome because he has experienced it all and Christ has experienced it all. And the secret place is important because it takes away people pleasing. When you're in the secret place, it gives you a boldness because if you're outside of God or you're just amongst people 24-7 or you're a Christian and you're around leaders and more leaders and more leaders and more leaders, they can become your idols. They can become your gods or they can become your commands or who you follow or whom you listen to or they can become 
your God, an idol, but they can intervene with your relationship with God. And they could be saying things that seem right. They could be saying things that are scriptural, but it's not necessarily for you. And when you're abiding with Christ, your path will be different because we all have different gifts and we all have different paths and we're all called to do different things. The body of Christ, it says there's an eye, there's a tongue. We're called to be different and you know what you're called to be. You know who you are when you abide in Christ. He unravels those layers. But abiding with Christ is so important because outside of Christ, you will operate on your own strength and you will be striving in the world and it's very difficult. But when you're in Christ, you have the joy of the Lord. You have a peace that surpasses all understanding and it makes life that much easier because when he is present, the enemy will be less present to a certain degree. There will be more peace in your land. There will be more peace in your life. There will be more joy. But when you're outside of that, operating in your own flesh, and blood in your own strength. You are just striving. You are doing things by your own strength and it's not as easy. But also, abiding in Christ is very important to do as well because the scriptures say that God's word cuts like the sharpest sword, like a double-edged sword. It cuts between soul and spirit. Now, what does this mean? It means that when you hear the word of God, it's supposed to bring conviction. It is cutting between the lies. It is that light that comes down and it cuts into you and it hurts it convicts and the scriptures say that in the end times people won't tolerate sound doctrine they won't tolerate conviction meaning that they are living in lies of the enemy and i would not want my ears tickled all the way into eternal flame. You want to be convicted because that brings transformation. That brings fruit. That brings the presence of the Lord. It brings you closer to the Lord. The truth, the truth will set you free. Lies are comfortable, but lies are also of the enemy and they're destructive and their only job is to steal, kill, and destroy. So when you're in the secret place, you get that boldness. You are so present with God that when you come amongst people or a congregation or whomever, you speak the truth and you're minding the things that matter in the end. You're not minding people's minds or what they think about you. You're doing what God wants you to do. And when you're abiding in God, that's the most loving thing you can do. A lot of the times we think being a people pleaser or doing what people want or saying what people want us to say is a loving thing. When actuality it's not, it's very destructive and it leads people down a path of more destruction. The most loving thing you can do is being present in active and being in that secret place and speaking the truth. And the only way you can speak the truth is if the presence of God is with you. But that's what it is. And you get that boldness. You get the truth from that place. And when you hear God's words, it pierces between the lies. That's why people get angry. They get convicted. It's because God's word is piercing. It is cutting. It is exposing all of the lies. And you want all of those lies exposed. Conviction is a major thing, especially when you're following God. Especially for me, if I stop feeling conviction, I begin to get worried because it is the Holy Spirit that convicts you of your sin. When you first come to Christ, when you first get the Holy Spirit, you begin to feel conviction. Let's just say, for example, if you're drinking, smoking, partying, all of these different things in immoral relationships and you receive the Holy Spirit, you will begin to receive conviction because that seed, God's seed, His Spirit has come down. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit will come down and be a comforter, but it comes down and you have that spirit in you. You have that seed which grows into righteousness. It grows and it grows and it grows and it convicts you. That's why when I came to Christ, I was convicted of the immorality. I was convicted of the things that I was doing, slandering. I was convicted. I was convicted of just so many different things and that's how I really changed. It is just the conviction which led to repentance, which led to me producing fruit, which led to me growing closer to God. But conviction is important. Even now, if I'm not convicted of my actions, I'm worried because it is a fearful thing. Not that the Lord will ever leave you nor forsake you, but you can grieve the Holy Spirit. If you're doing the wrong things, if you're going rebelling against the commandments, if you're just doing what seems right to a man and there is no conviction and you get into that place, that's a dangerous place to be. And I feel like that's where a lot of churches, that's where a lot of places are. It's the way that seems right to a man where you begin to 
say, yeah, did God really say, or you twist scripture to your liking or to your situation or to your circumstance or to your sin or to your wrongdoings. That's what sensual wisdom is. It's self-seeking. And that's what I noticed in myself that I started to do. Now, scriptures would say one thing, but due to my sin or due to my stiff neckedness, I would try to say, did God really say, or I would try to dance around it or be like, yeah, but this is the situation. And I'm pretty sure God like would understand. It's a way that seems right to men and it's sensual and it's demonic and it's something you have to catch. And abiding with Christ in the secret place really cancels that out because you won't do what seems right to a man. You will do what seems right to God because you have a relationship. You're walking with him. And also the secret place, it's important because when you have that relationship, when you have that connection, it makes life so much more easier because in this life, it says you will have trials. You will have various trials, but count it all joy. And that's just something we can't escape. In this life, we will have troubles, but that's why the Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. He sent down the Comforter. So when you have the Holy Spirit, when you spend that time with God, there is that comfort. There is that peace that surpasses all understanding. There is that joy of the Lord. There is that anointing that breaks the yoke. There is this oil that makes things easier to slide through, easier to bear. When transitional seasons, you can actually trust God regardless of what the circumstances look like. Like you actually have faith because you feel him, he's present, and you can move in the right direction. And it just makes things smoother. But that's the thing. It is very subtle, but it is a counterfeit. So when we're without God, we're operating on our own strength. And the scriptures say, you think you are strong, lest you will fall. We're trying to operate in our own strength when we're not abiding in Christ. Christ is our strength. He is our rock. He is our foundation. He is that certainty. He is that peace. And it's just a counterfeit. And we have the commandments. We have the law. And then we have our own way, which is leaning on our own understanding. It's the way that seems right to a man. Or we try to find peace in all of these different things that are outside of God or try to find fulfillment outside of God. Or we idolize things and put them above God. It's all counterfeits of not abiding in Christ. And a lot of the times the Lord has to humble us and he has to strip the idols. He has to destroy those things in our life. So we stop grabbing for them. So we stop relying on them. So we stop seeking them. So we come back to abiding in Christ. And you will notice this, you know, even with pastors or whatever it may be, if you begin to idolize them or put them on this pedestal, which everybody makes mistakes, everybody will be held accountable. Everybody has their own walk. We all have our own journeys. But God, even, you know, if you idolize your pastor, a lot of people, they idolize their pastor and they will leave their church because their pastor leaves or they will have this idolatry and God will make sure whatever idolatry it is, he will tear it down and it will be painful. Even if it's the wrong person in your life, God will tear that relationship if it's not the right relationship. Even if it's money, if that's something you idolize because God says you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a spirit. There is a spirit behind money, this greed, this gain. There is a spirit of mammon, which is scriptural. Idols in your life, God will make sure that he tears those down. He rips those down and he always has a way of funneling you back into his presence when it is necessary. Reinhard Bonnke, he would say every time there was a crisis in my life, it was usually the Lord bringing up these check stops. So he would stop Reinhard Bonnke and he would bring up all of these, you know, red lights or these things inside of them that are just not of God. And this self-righteousness, this pride, it's so gross. It's so disgusting because it's not true. Like even myself, you can feel like a Pharisee or a Sadducee, self-righteous, and you're just throwing on this law, throwing on the stuff that you're not really living. And that's what happens when you abide outside of Christ. But the best way to really win people over is, you know, how are people going to fear the Lord around you, in your family, in your church, if you don't even fear the Lord yourself? How are people going to have faith in the Lord or have love for the Lord if they can't see it in you? The Holy Spirit abiding in Christ is so important because when that dwells within you, when you fear the Lord yourself, when it's true and when it's real, that will just wear off on people rather than just being a Pharisee, Sadducee. We should have fear of God, but it should come from a place of relationship of we're reverent of God, we're fearful of God, which is 
healthy because it makes us want to obey God. Not like, oh, he's some angry guy in the clouds waiting to strike us down with a thunderbolt if we make one mistake, which is not God. God's character is he wants us to live an abundant life. He wants us, he wants what's best for us. He says, I know my thoughts for you, which are continually good. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His way are higher than our ways. And understanding God's character is so important because he's not some angry, wrathful God. It says he's slow to anger and grace. I could get into a whole bunch of different things, but greasy grace is just disgusting and it's from the pits of hell. Grace, he has given you something you don't deserve and you're appreciative of it. You're thankful of it and you learn to just be thankful and you learn to repent and you learn to do the right things. For example, the scriptures talk about when somebody transgresses against you or they sin against you and you don't hold it over their heads. That is your glory. Love takes no records of wrongdoing. Like when somebody sins against you and you don't hold it over their head and you forgive them, naturally they want to change, they want to repent, and they feel a sense of gratitude. And that's the same way with God. When you receive grace, grace is something you receive that you don't deserve. If we truly got what we deserved, we should be in hell. If you want what you deserve, go to hell. That's what we deserve. And that's what we would have got if he didn't send Jesus down to die for our sins. Grace does something. When you mess up and you fail or something happens, but God has grace to redeem you, to restore you, that's not something you take advantage of. That's something you're thankful of. You repent and you learn from your ways of, yeah, I'm not going to do that again, or I'm going to learn. So thank you. Woo. Thank you, God. And mercy is when God withholds what you do deserve. Grace is when he gives you something you don't deserve. And mercy is when he doesn't give you something that you do deserve. Abiding in Christ is absolutely everything. He even says, apart from me, you can do nothing. And it's true because when it comes to strength, which we need, the scriptures say that in this life, you will have trouble. In this life, there will be various trials, but take heart because he has overcome the world. It says that the joy of the Lord is our strength and joy is not a natural emotion. Joy is a supernatural thing that comes upon you. Right? It's a divine thing that comes upon you that you can only get from the Lord. And that would give you endurance. That would give you boldness. That would give you strength in itself just by abiding. And not only that, you know, the peace that surpasses all understanding only comes from the Lord. So when you have these trials, when you have these things that pop up, you will have peace amongst madness. If you have revelation in a culture that has gone mad, you will be just fine. If you have that peace that surpasses all understanding, you will be fine. So abiding and really having a relationship with God is so vital for endurance. It's so vital for going strength to strength, faith to faith, because the strength comes from God. The faith comes from God. It says, make sure to give an account when people ask, what is the hope that dwells within you? The hope of Christ. We're called to give an account when people say, what is the hope that is within you, which is Christ? Producing faith fruit comes from Christ because to forgive, forgiveness comes from God. Like when you have the spirit of the Lord within you, you learn to forgive very easy. It's like he wipes your mind of the past and now you're focused on the present. I said that love takes no records of wrongdoing. So when love comes upon you, which is definitely only from the Lord, that also will just help you to produce fruit because it helps you to follow the commandments and God's commandments are there to bless you. They're there to prosper you. It's your best form of life. It's the boundaries of life of what to do, what not to do, where to go, where not to go, how to be blessed, how to be cursed, what line to walk, which line not to walk, how to do things properly. Like it's God's road of how to walk in a straight line while not walking into a crooked path or walking into the enemy's territory or doing something that will be a snare for you. It's all wisdom. It's all instruction. It's all guidance. It's all wisdom to live a godly life, to live 
live a straight path life. When you're abiding, when you have this presence, it's easy for you to give. It's easy for you to love your neighbor easier. A lot of these things that would be very difficult by yourself, operating on your own strength, when you're with the Lord, it will be second nature. It will be something you want to do because the Spirit is alive and active and that presence is among you. And humility comes to really putting God first. When you put God first, you will put His commandments first. Even the cherubim who were on the Ark of the Covenant, they had their wings blocking their face and blocking their eyes because the angels on the Ark of the Covenant, they were glorious. They were prestigious. And out of humility, they blocked their faces. Out of humility, they blocked themselves to honor the Son, to honor God. And when you honor God, it's about making sure that God is seen, just like the angels. That's why it says God gives grace to the humble, but resists the proud. God wants us to be humble. And he says, whoever exalts themselves will be humbled. Whoever humbles himself will be exalted. God likes humility. The reason being is because he is the king of kings. And if you are proud against the king of kings, right? Just imagine you had a natural king and you had, I guess, some commoner or you had just anybody acting proud around them. Obviously, that would get on the king's nerves, especially if we're the clay and he's the potter and we're acting puffed up and proud. He's like, I created you and you're trying to be your own self God. He will squash you to try to produce that fruit of humility, which will actually exalt you. And then you get exalted and then you get proud. It's something that has to be developed in the spirit. Like even in the scriptures, it says that the last will be first and the first will be last and the carnal mind will be like, okay, well, I'll just be last so I could be first. I even had this mindset. It's like, okay, well, I'll just be last so I can be first or okay, I'll just be a servant so I can be first. The carnal mind is so backwards. Man's understanding, what seems right to a man is so backwards. No, humility is humility all the way around without sensual wisdom. It's like ourselves, we think, okay, well, I'm going to be humble so I can be exalted. Okay, I'm going to be humble so I can gain material goods. Okay, I'm going to be humble so I can be blessed. That sensual and demonic wisdom is self-seeking wisdom. And that's what we can do with God's scriptures. Using it, you know, as a blessing or using it. Like God knows our hearts. There is nothing that can be hidden from God. And it really takes a deep cleaning, which comes from the secret place, which comes from being humble. That's why I was talking about sensual earthly wisdom, because even with scripture, you can manipulate it to do what seems right to a man. But that is the whole journey is sanctifying. That's what we should be doing is continually being pruned, continually being refined, continually being convicted, continually growing. Because if you think you have arrived, that is a dangerous place. Because if you think you have arrived and you think you know it all and you think you are the end all be all, in reality that means you have capped off and you cannot receive anything else. You cannot receive the next level. You cannot receive more wisdom. You cannot receive more revelation. You cannot receive. When you feel you are the end all be all, like you know it all, wherever you may be, that means you have capped off in the spiritual realm and also with God. If you have a hardened heart or if you're closed off, the Lord can't put anything else inside of you. But anyways, I will see you guys in the next one. Peace out. Oh, man.